Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you for coming. This session will address a topic of tremendous importance, uh, not only for structural engineers, but for our industry in general and for society in general. The consequences of the Grenfell fire tragedy are being felt not only in the UK, but around the world. My name is Glenn Bell. I'm president-elect of SEI, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. It was in the early hours of June 14, 2017, that a catastrophic fire engulfed London's Grenfell Tower. 71 people lost their lives that night. Drawing on material presented on the Grenfell Tower inquiry, our first speaker, Dr. Angus Law, will describe the structure and the layout of the building, the composition of the cladding system, and show how the fire was able to spread around the cladding of the building. Angus will show you footage from the night of the fire and then discuss routes and mechanism for the fire spread. Dr. Angus Law holds the Building Research Establishment Lectureship in Fire Safety Engineering at the University of Edinburgh and has previously held positions at the University of Queensland in Australia and as a fire safety engineer for O. Arup and Partners in the UK. Angus's research interests encompass the structural behavior of steel and concrete in response to fire, the behavior of mass timber in fire, vertical fire spread in cladding systems, and regulatory systems for fire safety. In the aftermath of the Grenfell Tower fire, Dr. Law advised the UK government's expert panel on fire safety, contributed to Dame Judith Hackett's review on building regulations, and supported the University of Edinburgh's expert witness work for the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Following the Grenfell Tower fire, there was an independent review of building regulations and fire safety by Dame Judith Hackett. Her findings were that there were many shortcomings in the safety culture of the UK construction industry. Our second speaker, Dr. Alistair Sohn, will describe the recommendations made to government to address the issues and describe progress that is being made for designers, constructors, and regulators. Alistair will then describe steps being taken to enhance fire safety and structural safety and how the consequences of that tragedy will influence standards and behavior worldwide. Dr. Sohn was formerly CEO of a firm of UK consulting engineers where he was responsible for the structural and civil engineering design on numerous projects of all types of structures in the UK and elsewhere. Alistair was a member and deputy chair of the UK Government Building Regulations Advisory Committee from 2001 to 2011. He was a visiting professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Liverpool and a member of the Ethics Committee of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Alistair developed the system of confidential reporting of structural safety, also known as CROSS, from 2005 onwards and since 2007 has been the Director of Structural Safety, incorporating the Standing Committee on Structural Safety, SCOS, together with CROSS. Alistair's goal has been to establish a network of international groups modeled on CROSS, and we're gonna to touch on that at the end of this session. Since the Grenfell fire in 2017, he has been advising the government's departments on professional institutions on structural safety matters. Finally, our third speaker, Nate Wittesek, will describe how the fire and its consequences prompted an international discussion and highlighted the need for redundancy in fire and life safety systems in buildings, with a focus on passive construction features, fire suppression systems, and means of egress. Through the lens of the U.S. regulatory system, the fire confirms the need for continued attention on the composition and arrangement of enclosure systems. The sense of many practitioners is that considerable work will, need, will be needed to refine code requirements, exceptions, and test standards used by industry as a whole to ensure the level that the public has come to expect, level of safety. Nate is a principal and vice president of Simpson Gumperton Hager. He has 20 years of experience working in fire protection and regulatory arenas. Nate brings a practical approach to fire protection engineering that reflects his diverse training and experiences in academia, code consulting for both new and existing facilities. 
performance-based fire protection engineering accessibility and the fire services in projects around the world. Nate is a registered fire protection engineer and certified fire explosions investigator. He's a member of the Tall Building Fire Safety Network and, a fire, and the Fire Safety Committee on the Council for Tall Buildings in the Urban ha Habitat. He is also an active participant on the NFPA 101 and 5000 technical committees where he focuses on regulatory issues, building and fire protection systems. With that, please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Angus Law. Thank you, Glenn, very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you also for the invitation uh, to, to speak here uh, today. Um, as, as Glenn said, I'm going to talk about the, the Grenfell Tower fire, and I'm going to talk about what happened um, on that night. Um, I'm just going to focus on the event itself, and then the other speakers are going to look more closely at the, the, the impacts that have then uh, followed from that. It's worth saying that all of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, this is all information that is in the public domain. Um, and has been uh, created as a function of the ongoing public inquiry uh, into the Grenfell Tower fire. Um, and so if you want to look, if you want to find out more information about this, if you want to see where I've got this material, you can go and visit the website of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry and, and have a look for yourself. Um, all of this information is available uh, on that website. I can't talk about the Grenfell Tower fire um, without talking about the victims. I mean, this is a technical presentation, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, own, it's appropriate to, to, to acknowledge that. Um, and I can, can't possibly do justice to the, all of the stories and the, the horror of that night. Um, but what I did want to do was just uh, simply uh, share with you the ages of the, uh, of the victims. Um, as you can see, there's a, a, a huge spread of ages of victims. The youngest victim uh, was Logan Gomez who was uh, stillborn uh, the day after the fire. Um, and the oldest victim was simply called Sheila, uh, and she uh, was 84 years old. The other thing that I wanted to uh, explain to you a little bit is in terms of just the location uh, of Grenfell Tower. Um, so this is a map of London, and uh, you might recognize the, uh, the River Thames running through the, the, the middle of the city. Um, and there's, a, there's the locations of the, the Houses of Parliament and Buckingham Palace that may be familiar to you. Um, Grenfell Tower is very central in London. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just up the road, so it's right in the, in, in the center of uh, London. I think it's important to, uh, to understand that. Now, in terms of the building itself, uh, it was uh, built in the 1970s. It was a, a cast uh, in situ concrete frame, and you can see a, a picture of it here. Um, and what you can see there is you've got, the, uh, you've got concrete columns, you've got concrete slab, and you've got concrete spandrel beams. Um, and in between those, you can see the window openings, uh, which are those in, uh, in white. In 2012 through 2016, there was a refurbished program, a uh, refurbishment program uh, at Grenfell Tower. Um, and, and the most obvious kind of implication of that, just looking at the building, uh, was the external cladding system was very significantly uh, changed. And you can see that here. This is a, a picture of the almost completed uh, cladding system. And we're going to come back to look a little bit more closely at the specifics of that cladding system uh, in a moment. There were various other changes made in the tower as well. I'm, I'm not going to focus on those uh, today. In terms of the building itself, um, the layout, the floor plan, uh, this is what it looked like. Um, and so uh, it looked like this on pretty much every floor. Uh, and what you've got there is six uh, apartments uh, around the perimeter of the building. Uh, four of those are two-bedroom apartments, um, and two of them are one-bedroom uh, apartments. Um, and we've also got in there, we've got uh, a stair core, so a single stair core, uh, and two lifts um, that I've highlighted there on the, on the left-hand side. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was a, a common lobby uh, that linked all the flats, so that would be the, the route for the residents to access into their apartments uh, and then also to leave and to obviously to egress as well. So in terms of the fire itself, um, as, we, as we already heard, um, that fire uh, started uh, on the 14th of June uh, 2017. Uh, in terms of the location, it was in flat 16. Flat 16 was on the fourth floor uh, of Grenfell Tower. 
Uh, and this is just a blow up of the, of the kitchen uh, of, of Flat 16. Uh, and there's some discussion amongst the, the, the various experts appointed to the quarry about the exact uh, source, the cause of the ignition. But what we, we absolutely do know is it started in the, uh, in the bottom right hand corner of that image, uh, somewhere the fridge freezer or, or, or around there the, near the bottom of the window there. Um, and so part of the reason we know that is because the occupant of that flat was awoken by uh, his smoke detector. Uh, and he uh, went into the kitchen and he saw the fire. Uh, and then he made this phone call. Fire brigade? Yeah, hello, hi. In the fire, flat 16 Greenfield Tower. Sorry, your fire where? The flat, flat 16 Greenfield Tower. In the fridge. Well, hang on. Flat, flat 16 Greenfield Tower. Flat 16. And what's the postcode? W11-1TG. W11-1TG. Yeah, but can you quick, please? Yeah, would you just, I have to get the address, okay, Glen... Flat 16, Greenfield Park, W11-1TG. The fire brigade are on their way. So that place is at about 5 to 1 uh, in the morning, and as you heard, the, the fire service were dispatched within 30 seconds uh, of the start of that call. Uh, the occupant of that flat then turned off uh, his electricity, he closed the door behind him, and then he went around on his uh, floor and woke up um, uh, all of his neighbors to tell them that there was a, uh, a fire uh, going on. He then went down uh, the stairs, uh, and he went outside of the tower where he took a series of videos um, of the early stages of the fire. Uh, there's a few of them, but we're only going to look at uh, one of them now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to step outside of the tower, and uh, we're going to jump around a little bit in terms of uh, what I show you, but I, I, hopefully the logic will make sense a little bit as we, as we get there. So when we go outside of the tower, um, this is him looking up uh, at the, the kitchen window uh, of his apartment. <laughs> So we can see there's the, the window, we can clearly see there's a, there's a fire there, uh, and if we look closely we can maybe you know, uh, understand a little bit about where the fire is on that, uh, that image. Um, and that's uh, eight minutes past one. Uh, so the fire is clearly uh, located in the, in the window area. So it's the bottom right hand corner of that, uh, that image that we were looking at uh, before. And if we look at the outside of the tower, so if we try and orientate ourselves with respect to the entire building, uh, it's uh, the flat that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, on that particular image, so it's flat 16 on the fourth floor. So before we go and look at the spread of the fire, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the build-up, the makeup of the cladding system uh, at Grenfell Tower. Um, and so this is an image, obviously, of the, 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 uh, the aftermath of the fire. Uh, and the thing I wanted to draw your attention to is these things called rain screen cassettes. So those are the gray um, panels that you can see on this image. Uh, and you can see the, uh, there's lots of different panels of the, of the outside of the building. And those are what we call the, the, the rain screen cassettes. Um, those are comprised of, um, of, of uh, well, it's a product called uh, rain bond polyethylene. Um, and it's a rain screen uh, cladding. And so what, what you've got there is you've got a, a 0.5 millimeter thick um, layer of aluminium, a 3 millimeter thick layer of polyethylene, uh, and another 0.5 millimeter thick uh, layer of aluminium. And so that's what the product, uh, that's what the product looks like. Um, and so if we look a little bit closer um, at, at that building, this is this, the equivalent location on the other side of the building from where the, where the fire started. If we look at that, uh, that window, and we zoom in a little bit, and we take a vertical slice, if we take a section through the building. Um, and so we're going to look at the top, and we're going to look at the bottom of that, of that window buildup. Um, you're going to get something like this. Um, so what we've got there is at the top, you've got the, the concrete slab. At the bottom, you've got the spandrel panel. And then you've got the inside uh, and the outside of the building. If we overlay onto that the different uh, elements of the construction, we've got the original construction, which was the, the timber batten and some uh, insulation uh, from the original building. And this would have been the location of the original window. So that would have been the window uh, prior to the renovation. During the renovation, there were quite a number of uh, changes made. Uh, and one of the objectives was to improve the thermal performance of the building. Um, and so what happened is that uh, there was, uh, the outside of the building was retrofitted with an insulation. And I don't know how familiar you are with these kind of build-ups, but they're quite complex in terms of the various geometries. Um, and I can't possibly you know, show all of the permutations in this, uh, in this presentation, but I just wanted to give you an idea uh, of what it looks like. So we've got some aluminium fixing rails uh, on the front of that. Um, and then we've got some foam insulation um, that's mounted onto, uh, onto, the front of the, uh, onto the front of the concrete. 
And then over that, we've got those rain screen cassettes that we were looking at before. Uh, and in between that, we've got a cavity. So it's a rain screen cavity to create a ventilated, uh, ventilated facade. On top of that, we've got, then got the, the new window that was put in place, and you can see it's moved out. Uh, uh, it's further out from the building than the previous one. And then that's all finished by a UPVC window board um, uh, just to create a finish there. And so that's the arrangement um, that, we're, that we're looking at here. And as I say, it, it varies depending on where you are in the building. But fundamentally, uh, we have the rain screen cassette, we've got a void, and then we've got the insulation material. When I'm talking about the insulation, that's predominantly this product, which is uh, polyisocyanurate foam, uh, so PIR. Um, uh, this one is uh, one that was uh, from a column section, so it's about 100 millimeters thick in this case. Uh, and what we've got is the foam, and on either side, we've got a very thin layer of aluminum of the order of 0.1 millimeters, just a very thin sheet uh, on the front there. So those are the kind of products that we're looking at on this external, on this external wall. So now we're going to go back outside of the building. Hopefully now you understand a little bit what, how the cladding is uh, built, built up. You can uh, make some of your own interpretation of what we're looking at. Um, but what we're going to see is the spread of the fire over the outside of the building. So this is at nine minutes past. Hey, you lot, come away from that. Come away from that. Come on. Get over there. Get over there. Oh, good so you can maybe see the fire has you know, grown a little bit there, but we also have debris uh, on the floor sitting below the, uh, sitting below the, uh, on the ground there, um, which is what, something we saw throughout the, uh, the night of the Grenfell Tower fire. So if we go a little bit later to uh, just six minutes later, uh, we've got a real change in the behavior. From an isolated fire just around that window area, we've now got uh, a much bigger fire. Now, if you listen closely on this video, you can hear the glazing uh, shattering uh, inside the, uh, in the compartment window. I hope these people are the door. Huh? <laughs> oh, God. The glass is cracking. That's scary. So at around this time, the fire service were making an intervention in, into, into the compartment. Uh, and the fire service were ultimately able to extinguish the, the compartment before it reached flashover. Um, so m much of what you're seeing in this, uh, in this video is, ex is external flaming associated with the burning of the, uh, the cladding on the outside of the building. Then if we go a little bit later, so another uh, kind of six minutes uh, down, uh, down the track, you can see now the fire has spread up you know, six, seven stories uh, up, the, up the outside of the building directly above uh, flat 16. They're on one floor. That's in my yard. That's in my yard. It's in my yard. And then if we uh, go forward another little bit uh, in time to, uh, to uh, uh, 0127 in the morning, uh, we can see in this video the, the, the flames reach the top uh, of the tower. It's gone all the way. Well, you can also see in that uh, middle uh, image there is a lot of the debris on the ground that's, that's dropped down from the tower uh, as, the, as, the, as the burning has taken place. Um, so again, it's what we saw in that, uh, that earlier photo, but much larger in this case. So the fire got to the top of the tower. It took uh, less than 20 minutes for it to really go from the, uh, the ignition of the cladding initially all the way to the top of the building. Um, but it didn't stop there. Um, what happened next was that the fire spread around the the outside of the building uh, and eventually uh, encompass the, the entire, uh, entire loop of the building. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just look a little bit uh, at what happened there. And so this is a, uh, obviously an image of the, of the damaged building. And I want to look at the very top of the building. And so it's the architectural uh, crown uh, of the building. So this is a, um, a decorative feature, if you like, at the very top of the building. And so if you look there, you can hopefully see there's a, there's a concrete parapet um, there at the very top of the building with little circles in it. Um, and then overlaid onto that is uh, uh, the new uh, architectural crown. Uh, and that was comprised, again, of this aluminum composite uh, material, these, these cassettes. Um, and what, what was observed is that the fire spread in the first location, uh, always around the tower, or almost always around the tower, was at the, that point of the architectural crown. And what we can see is we can see burning below uh, those, those elements of, um, of aluminum composite material at the top. Uh, at the top of the tower. Uh, and that would have been what it, uh, it would have looked like uh, prior to the damage taking place. 
So we're going to look now at a, a couple of videos just showing the progression of that. These are now from the, the police uh, helicopter, um, so we can see uh, from, from above. And what you can hopefully see there at the top of that image is the, the burning underneath uh, the architectural crown. And you can also see the leading edge of the fire is at the very top of the building. So if we uh, go a little bit later now, so 2.22, uh, and we look at the, uh, the, the top of the building, we can see a very similar uh, similar behavior here is the fire spreads over one of the columns uh, and we've also got the fire at the leading edge um, at, at, the, at the top of the building there uh, on the north face. And then the next one, uh, video I wanted to show you is the fire coming over the corner uh, of the northwest face of the tower. And what we can see if we look at this video is we can see the burning at the top of the column, so we have a large aluminium composite panel box. Uh, we've got spread down the column, and you can also see burning in between the individual panels um, as it goes on. So that was what I wanted to show you in terms of the, sp the, the spread of the fire. And, and, and as I said, the, uh, the, the entire building became en engulfed by the, uh, by the fire over the course of, uh, of several hours. Now what I wanted to do is to turn attention to inside the tower. Uh, and look a little bit at what's happening there. And of course, that evidence is, uh, is not quite as visual as the evidence that we've been just looking at. It needs to be uh, patched together from various witness statements, uh, 999 uh, emergency calls. Um, but I also want to just say a little bit about what's called the stay put strategy. Um, and so the stay put strategy is a very common way to manage, uh, manage residential blocks of flats in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the idea is that if there's a fire, people should be uh, in, in an apartment. Somebody will escape from that apartment, but people should be able to remain in place in the rest of their building, uh, in the rest of the building in, uh, throughout the duration of the fire, and the fire service can come in and put it out. So if there's a fire on uh, the fourth floor, for example, the fire service would come in. Uh, they would go up the, uh, the elevators, they would set up their uh, equipment, and then go up the stairs and, and fight the fire. And there'd be no need to evacuate the rest of the building. Now, of course, to support that, uh, we require a series of fire safety measures. And so the first of those is a level of compartmentalization uh, of each of the apartments, uh, a level of compartmentalization to the uh, shared, the lobby spaces that, that people are using. Uh, and we also require compartmentalization to the, uh, to the stair itself to protect that stair. So people can remain in their flats, uh, but also we're protecting the stair such that if they want to, they can use it and get out. A further measure for protection is often uh, uh, an extraction system to clear any smoke that enters that, that shared lobby, again, in the interest of protecting that stair core. So, I'm going to draw on uh, some of the other material here. So there's, there's three expert witness reports I've, I've used to create this presentation. Uh, one of Luke Bisbee, my colleague at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and also Jose Torreira, uh, who's here in the audience uh, today, and also uh, Dr. Barbara Lane from Ovarup and Partners. So this is, uh, this is some uh, of the characterization that uh, Professor Torreira made in his, uh, in his report. So hopefully I do it uh, justice. But he, he identified four different stages of the fire. So there's that initial stage uh, where we have uh, uh, the fire contained within the flat. Then we have uh, the, the spread up to the top of the tower, which is what we just witnessed. Uh, then we've got a phase where there's a level of internal migration within the building. So people were able to move around within the building. The conditions weren't, weren't very good, uh, but they were able to do it uh, in, in some cases. And then you've got the final stage, stage four, which is called the untenable stage, where the conditions are really very, very poor uh, within the building. And so what I wanted to do is just look at how people uh, escaped from, this, from, from the building. So this is the uh, axis. We've got time along the bottom. We've got a number of people or casualties in Glenfell Tower uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, and this is the data from, um, from Dr. Barbara Lane's uh, report, uh, which is, uh, I think, some of the interpretation of the uh, work that the Metropolitan Police did. Uh, and you can see there's a, a lot of evacuation in the early stages of, uh, of the fire through stage one and stage two. And, uh, and then towards the end of the fire, there's very little evacuation. And much of that evacuation was facilitated by the fire and rescue service. And of course, not everyone got out. So if we overlay those different stages on there, you can see uh, how, the, uh, how people were able to move out of the building in the early stages and then not in those later stages of the fire. 
The other thing that I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to uh, and, and look at in, in terms of the evacuation was the, was the conditions within the staircase. Um, and so this uh, is uh, uh, an interpretation of some of the work that was put into uh, Dr. Barbara Lane's report um, and looking at those conditions within that staircase. Uh, and so in the early stages of the fire, uh, uh, that's you know, right after the ignition through to about uh, 18 minutes past one, the clear conditions are reported um, in the stairwell. But then, as the time progresses, as we move through to the to point where the, uh, the flame, the fire reaches the top of the building, those conditions um, uh, start to worsen a little bit. So there's some limited smoke. And it's worth saying these, these terms, limited smoke is obviously a, a subjective term from, uh, from witness statements and such like. Then as we step forward in time, as we get into that, uh, as we get into that third phase uh, of the fire, we can see that we start to get really significant and thick smoke uh, within the stairwell. Uh, that's really starting to get challenging for people to, uh, to evacuate. Um, and then as we uh, progress further, that thick smoke also becomes um, uh, uh, substantially, um, it becomes hot. Um, so there's substantial heat uh, within the stairwell. Um, and that really continues um, all the way through uh, all the way through to the extinction. I mentioned a second ago that there was some movement around the building, uh, and, and one of the things that, that people did was they moved from the apartments uh, that were above the, uh, the, um, the, the, the flat of origin, and they moved to the southwest corner of the building, which is the last location to be affected by the fire. Um, and so people moved around the building seeking, uh, seeking refuge in those locations. One of the other things that uh, happened um, was that people actually moved up the building. And so this is a plot of, uh, of casualties. That, uh, this is from uh, Professor Torero's report, uh, which shows casualties who moved uh, down and up uh, in the building. You can see a large number of those people moved up from around the 19th, 20th floor up to the, to the top of the building where, where they unfortunately perished. So, in terms of what happened on the night of the fire, of course, that's a, that's a, a brief summary uh, as, um, as time allows in, in this forum. There's a couple of points, though, that I wanted to uh, make. Um, the first of those is that the original fire, so that initiating incident, um, that was a, a normal kitchen fire. So that was a, a design event. Um, I think it's also worth saying that that the, the stay put strategy uh, was compromised as soon as that cladding material went onto the, went onto the building. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to say is that all the experts were, were agreed that, that Grenfell Tower did not comply with the building regulations. So when we talk about um, you know, where, where there is uh, you know, future work to be done, the, 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 the tower did not comply uh, with the building regulations. Um, so, looking forward then, um, I've been drawing on the material from the, from the public inquiry. Um, there's also a, a police uh, investigation ongoing, so a criminal investigation, uh, which is running in parallel. Uh, but there's also been a, a review of the uh, building regulations and fire safety that's conducted by Dame Judith Hackett. And I think that's where we're going to now move on to, and Alice is going to talk uh, a little bit about that. So, thank you for, for your attention, and uh, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for attending. My name's Alistair Soane, and I'm going to follow on from the description of the fire and the, the harrowing events that took place. And I'm going to start off with giving a bit of background to what the organization I represent does and the reason why we've become involved in the aftermath of the fire. We have a structural safety group in the UK, which is sponsored by the Institution of Structural Engineers, which is also co-host here, the Institution of Civil Engineers, and a government department which is called the Health and Safety Executive. They provide the background to what we do. And in 1976, the group set up a team of experts who would look at public safety, and they would gather their information from information available from sources which obviously did not include the internet, did not include high-speed communications. So they collected this information often long after an event had taken place, worked out whether a risk was acceptable or not, and it published alerts and topic papers. Then, much, much later, it was decided that there was a large volume of material which never got published, never saw the light of day. 
because it, for various reasons it was held within people's minds or within the organization memories. So it was decided to set up a confidential reporting system. So we collect confidential data. It was modeled on a system used by NASA for um, the Federal Aviation Authority here. And we have a panel of experts who provide commentary on the lessons which might be learned from the reports which we were given. We've got a database, we publish newsletters, and if you go to the website, look up structural safety, which is quite near the top of any Google search, you will find our material, you can log on to it, and you can register to receive our reports. And the most important asset that we've got is that we have a panel and a committee comprising of over 20 people from throughout the UK industry who give their time and their services freely and they provide the advice which is subsequently distilled into the information that we publish. So those volunteers are absolutely crucial to our success. Now in any risk enterprise there is a pyramid. This one is taken from Aviation Safety Reporting System and it starts at the bottom with normal operations, proceeds up to when there might be incidents, when there might be injuries, and of course, when there might be fatalities. And Grenfell is right up at the very top of that. Now, something like Grenfell will not come to us first. We get information on the lower three tiers, and a lot of it in the first and second tier. And what we're interested in there are precursors. Because if you can identify a precursor and learn from it, you can go some considerable way to learning lessons and ensuring by appropriate action that there are not more severe incidents later. So Grenfell was obviously at the very top of that risk pyramid. There were multiple fire risk problems. There are immense societal problems. And in many ways, the societal implications will be greater than the structural implications. The UK building regulations will change and they will change worldwide and safety worldwide will change as well. So it's very unfortunate that these seminal events catch the imagination of governments, catch the imagination of those professionals involved and of course most importantly they catch the imagination of the public and there's huge public pressure to do something about Grenfell. And of all the parties involved, there have been comments about those who did the design, those who were involved in the construction, those involved in the management of the building, and those involved in the ownership of the building. Now, the initial government action, very quickly, they set up the independent public inquiry led by a judge. And that is the information that you have been, you've been given by Angus, the first part of inquiry is completed, and that was what took place on the night. Uh, the report has not been published, it may be published later this year. Then will come phase two, and phase two will look at the background, why did it happen? What went wrong? So we can't talk about the first part because it's not published, apart from the publicly available evidence that, that, that Angus showed. Um, and we can't obviously speculate on the second part. But at the same time, the government appointed Dame Judith Hackett, who is a chemical engineer, highly respected, to lead an independent review of two things, the building regulations in the UK and fire safety. And we came in there because we were able to give evidence to her. Now, obviously, there were a large number of parties who provided evidence. Um, but what we had was data gathered over years about events and about concerns related to the construction industry. So these were not fire related necessarily, in fact most of them weren't, but they were related to the culture, the type of operation that went through certain sectors of the UK industry. Evidence was also provided by the members of the Institution of Structural Engineers and we provided evidence about precursors about structural safety events and about fires. Now, from our perspective, that is our perspective in structural safety, we see the worst side of many of these things. And some of the stuff which came to Judith Hackett was indicative of bad practice. But 
of course, there is the very best of practice in the UK, as is everywhere else. So the vast majority of buildings are put up very competently, they're designed competently, they operate very, very safely, there's nothing at all to be concerned about. So we are looking at a small but potentially highly risky or dangerous sector. This is not to imply that the whole of British uh, construction industry is riddled with problems. But there are precursors to fires. And this was one in London in 2009. And the windows in this building had been refurbished with plastic windows. So the original metal windows were replaced with plastic. There was a fire which spread up the outside. And the tragedy here was that people followed the stay put philosophy, which Angus described. But nevertheless, there were a number of fatalities which could possibly have been avoided had those people left the building earlier. And the coroner who, who ruled over the inquest recommended that the relevant authorities looked at this problem um, and nothing was done or nothing substantive was done. So that is a precursor of a facade fire. There's another one in Melbourne in a relatively new building and that picture is horrifyingly familiar with the ones which we've just been seen. In Dubai, there were two fires, again of a similar nature, and in none of those, the Dubai one, um, were people injured or killed. And it may be because that was a very modern building, although the cladding was of the same type that we've heard about. The, behind that, there was a very modern building, there were much better fire precautions, fire safety, um, and although the fires took place, there were no casualties, but they were precursors. So, Dame Judith published her interim recommendations, and this is what she had to say after a, about a year on the, on the case, that I've been shocked by some of the practices I've heard about, and I'm convinced of the need for a new intelligent system of regulation and enforcement for high-rise and complex buildings. And a term that's used frequently in her report is an HRRB, which is a high-rise residential building. Now, by US standards, these are not very high, but by UK standards, they are. And, and the, the general uh, accepted height for these is about 18, 20 meters. So her final reports were that roles and responsibilities for safety were unclear. And it was particularly the case that you couldn't separate out who was responsible for what. There was no overall safety controller. The designers sometimes subcontracted elements to their design. Contractors would often not continue with the original designers, but would appoint their own designers to carry out the later stages of, of the work. The contractor would also appoint many subcontractors, and sometimes there were cascades of subcontractors. And at every step, people attempted to pass responsibility on without accepting the responsibility that went with their job. So there were no clear roles and responsibilities for safety from inception to completion to occupation. She found that the regulations and guidance were ambiguous, not wrong, but in, sometimes the regulations could be interpreted in ways which would benefit those who wanted to interpret them in, in a specific manner. That compliance with the regulations was weak. In the UK, there are very rarely prosecutions for non-compliance with regulations of anything. Um, and, and in construction, there are very rarely people who fail to comply with the regulations who are then taken to account. The only time that happens is there is a fatality, in which case the authorities can bring in corporate manslaughter um, prosecutions, and they do so successfully. That competence was patchy. It's very easy to say so-and-so is a competent operator. It's much more difficult to measure that, and it's much more difficult to assess how competency is measured and how it is continually updated. She found that product testing, labeling, and marketing was opaque. 
Evidence to us has come in reports of even worse practices, and we have come across forged certificates in relation to products. So what somebody thinks they are buying is not necessarily what they're buying at all. The certificate is false. And very importantly, residents' voices go unheard, even when safety issues were identified or are identified, often people will not pay attention to what residents say. There is no mechanism for them to bring their reporting to the, to the public gaze. Now, her final report is very long, something like 170 pages. But if you look on our website and you look at the SCOS alert on building a safer future, you'll find that's all condensed down into five pages um, which cover the main issues of interest to safety engineers and to structural engineers. So her recommendation, firstly, was a stronger and tougher regulatory framework. She said that buildings must be regarded as systems and not simply as piecemeal bits to be put together by people who are not connecting all the dots. She's recommending a safety case approach rather than a prescriptive approach for high-rise residential buildings. And this is the first for the UK. Safety cases are used in nuclear industry, they're used in offshore industry, energy sectors, but they're not used for traditional buildings. That there must be clear responsibilities for ongoing safety. And that includes the safety from the time the building is handed over to whoever is the owner or whoever is going to manage the building. And she said uh, that there must be more cross-reporting. So she took what we had said um, in our evidence and said, OK, we need to build on that. So she has asked for more cross-reporting in various sectors. And finally, she wants a golden thread. And this is a very good analogy. So the golden thread starts when the client has the idea for constructing the building. It goes on through the designer, through the checkers, through the regulators, through the contractors, through the subcontractors, through to those who manage the building. And those must all be contained together. And the mechanism for doing this is going to be the digital world. So everything is going to be put on a digital system or digital systems in such a way that they can be followed right through from beginning to end. And it's a global concern because the Hackett Inquiry took evidence from people in various countries and it's not only a UK one. Um, it's unfortunate that we're having to lead the way in this, in this tragedy. But if you search Google, or any other search engine for deaths in buildings. Every day, somewhere in the world, there are cases, and sometimes there are a substantial number of people around the world killed in buildings. So moving slightly uh, off, off the, or moving forward from what we have said, is there a case that buildings are becoming more complex or fires are perhaps becoming more complex and I'm going to bring in another example here um, and talk about a difficulty if they are becoming more complex are we likely to get further up our risk pyramid now this is a car park in Liverpool in the UK the figure of eight shape at the bottom is an arena just above that and to the right is a multi-story car park it is flanked immediately on the right and the top by apartment blocks and on the left-hand side by an F-shaped hotel. So it's pretty constrained. Um, there was an event going to take place in the, in the arena, so the car park was pretty full when it caught fire. Now this was a hydrocarbon fire. The fuel load was equivalent to a full road tanker full of fuel going up. 30% of all modern cars are made of plastic. So the fuel load was enormous. These fires were destroyed. Sorry, these cars were, were, were destroyed within there. And because this was on a reclaimed uh, area of an old dock, there was a lot of water nearby. And the fire brigade found they could not put the fire out they could only contain it. 
and the amount of water required to contain it could not be obtained from the hydraulics nearby. And in fact, they had to bring in several very large capacity pumps and pump water from the docks in order to contain the fire. So the building itself was, was completely gutted, but they saved the arena, the apartments, and the hotel. That's what it looked like from inside. Um, the floors were extremely damaged and totally unsafe. So a, a collision tolerant drone was used, which is a wonderful piece of kit. It's, it's within a kind of a, a carbon fiber um, necklace. This, this was able to be driven through the car park. It actually landed on the car, which was the source of the fire. And it took lots and lots of videos, some of which can't be released yet for insurance purposes but it's provided a vast amount of information about the state of the concrete within that building. And here, 12 months later, is it being demolished. Um, and Grenfell Tower was an in-situ concrete building, so cast in place. This had precast columns, precast beams, and precast slabs. And the columns and beams were tied together by pre-stressing cables, so it was a very robust form of construction. Um, and a lot of information has been available about the damage which was done to this. Um, but it indicates the robustness of an in situ concrete frame because this was subject to a fire of many hours duration, as was Grenfell. And in both cases, there was no collapse during or immediately after the fire. So here are some more slightly unusual fires. This was a timber balcony. Um, so one balcony catches fire and up it goes. No fatalities, fortunately. Here is a grocery warehouse. And this is a very modern warehouse. It, it has got lots and lots of small robots. You can see them on the, on the right-hand side. They operate on a grid and they move crisscross, to and fro, picking up stuff from underneath uh, and sending the, this off to be packaged. And these robots are not autonomous, they're driven by a system, but there's lots and lots of machinery there. That caught fire, the cause of which is not known, but the fire brigade had great difficulty in getting in because of the close mesh nature of the grid on which these robotic devices operated. So there are, with changes in technology, uh, there are changes in the type of fire we get in the hazards faced by and challenges faced by firefighters in putting them out. And these have got to be considered by designers. Go back to Australia now. And again, just, just two or three weeks ago, there was another cladding fire. So in the UK, there was a ban on combustible cladding. And the ban was brought about because of intense public pressure. Now, Dame Judith Hackett was asked when she published a report, why didn't you ban cladding? Her response was, I wasn't asked whether cladding should be banned. She was looking at regulatory systems and, and fire regulations. But the government has decided to ban um, combustible cladding on new buildings or where there are material changes of use, a material change of use being such as putting a, a new cladding on the building. All elements of the external walls will be covered. And there have been various, obviously, um, people concerned about this. And the timber industry are very concerned. Can you ban externally flammable cladding when your building is made of timber? A, a slightly more esoteric ban has happened on the glazing, which is used or may be used on the barriers to balconies, because that has got two or more sheets of glass. And between them, there is a plastic glue that plastic glue is flammable, so under the new rules, you can't, put, um, you can't put that type of glazing on a balcony. You're going to have to use toughened glass instead of laminated glass. So there are, there are going to be other uh, unexpected consequences from this ban. But the government made a statement now to say they are going to take forward all of the Hackett recommendations. And this is quite a big deal for a, for a government to do because it means that there have got to be changes to the regulatory framework, which takes an immense amount of time and trouble to do. Uh, standards have got to be clearer and guidance 
Now, some standards and some guidance come from the private sector, so they got heavily involved. Residents will be at the heart of this safety issue, so they'll be given a voice. And the most difficult one of all uh, is for a government to say, we're going to change the culture. Now, changing a culture is an extraordinarily difficult job. It takes a very long time to do, and it is not an easy task at all. But safety reporting is going to become part of this new culture. There's going to be a legal requirement to report certain events, and there's going to be a prescribed list of events. It's going to be difficult, however, to get organizations to report, to say, I have made a problem, I've got a failure. So in parallel with that, there is going to be an extended cross version, which is going to look at all other concerns apart from the mandatory ones. It's going to look at structural safety and fire safety. And there is on our website a system for making reports and for getting that information to us and from us to be processed and out into the public domain. Now, the largest category we've got of buildings at the moment which will require analysis are called large panel structure buildings. And those were put up about 40 years ago. And the most infamous of those was called Ronan Point. And Ronan Point partially collapsed because of a relatively small gas explosion when connections between the panels of wall and floor failed. So there's a program of assessment going to take place for a large number of those buildings in the UK under the new Hackett rules, and the Institution of Structural Engineers is going to be involved in that. So we have got here large panel structures on which nothing has gone wrong for 40 years. There was one explosion, so the risk is very, very small. But nevertheless, it's a risk which has now come up to the surface and, and as far as the public are concerned. And the intention is to drive that down so that make sure whether it's by uh, assessment and then making some modifications or making an assessment and saying they're fine to make sure that those large panel structure buildings are completely safe. And this is a report that we got way back in 2009, so this may be a precursor. This was a large panel structure which had reached the end of its life. The client decided to demolish it. A demolition firm was called in. They got a high-rise device. They nibbled away at the top of this building, and the whole corner collapsed. So a disproportionate progressive collapse. And it was found that the links connecting the various slabs and panels together was not sufficiently strong. So all of those buildings were meant to have been strengthened, but the next assessment process is to make sure that they are properly done. So the immediate consequences of the fire are there's going to be more attention to structural and fire safety. There's going to be a recognition of the importance of competency, the need to train for it, and the need for this to be justified. There's a thrust for changes to the culture in the building industry, and I say a thrust because it's quite difficult to ascertain where it's going to go, but the impetus is there and the desire for change is there. There's going to be better regulation with higher penalties, much higher penalties, and these will provide challenges and opportunities for professional institutions such as SEI and iStruct uh, which will benefit our members and ultimately will benefit the public. Now, after all the work we've done on structural safety, after all the work that we've done following on the Hackett Report, there are a number of items of reflective thinking, just of general interest to both designers and constructors, to consider the risks of both known and unforeseen events. This is the famous known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And some of those we're dealing with are the unknowns, unknowns, trying to assess where the next potential risk will come from. Unexpected consequences. A bolt may fail on some component and there's very little damage, nothing much happens. A bolt fails holding down a tower crane and the tower crane collapses on a live railway. The potential consequences are enormous. We are always pushing for initiatives to develop better technologies, stronger technologies, cheaper technologies, more robust technologies or whatever. But 
a, a reflective thinking engineer will look at the circumstances and decide whether those changes have got any risks and whether those risks have been properly managed. And again, finally, to release safety critical information. If you know something which could help your colleagues, help the industry, help the public, then there are mechanisms for letting people know and it's in your interest as well as everybody else's to release that safety critical information. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. If we see too many more fires like the Grenfell fire, I fear that we run the risk of creating a crisis of confidence in the industry. When we think about the aftermath of this fire, there are two arenas. There's the public and then there is the AE industry. From the standpoint of the public, we have a mythology that surrounds high-rise safety in this country. The mythology goes both ways. You, you've seen it in the movies. You've seen it in movies like The Towering Inferno or the latest version of that, Skyscraper. These, what they have in common are that there's this notion of an, a building that has the highest level of safety, but somewhere lurking in it is a problem that we don't know about. The headlines say it all. Could a tragedy like the Grenfell fire happen in the US? I've broken down today's discussion about the impacts to our industry in the United States into four questions and the issues that surround those questions. The first question, of course, could it happen to us? The second question, how do our codes address this risk? Are we changing things? What's being done to pre prevent this in the future? And how will this affect us moving forward? Could this happen to us? In short, the answer is it already has many times. We can go back to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory that was spurred on by oil-soaked wood floors. We could move ahead to the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire where we had combustible finishes inside the building that had a somewhat surprising outcome. We could fast forward to 1980s when we had the MGM Grand Fire where we had 85 people die remote from the actual fire that occurred on the lowest level. We could fast forward to fires such as this, which occurred in Las Vegas, and we have a casino on fire, the headlines in the news, the video, similar things we've seen back in 2008. So we've had our events, and we continue to have these events. In understanding the question of whether it could happen to us, there are numerous sub-questions. We have to look at our own building stock. Do we have buildings that have materials similar to this? Of course we do. Do we have novel new materials in these buildings, some of which we may or may not understand perfectly well? We do. The point was previously made that the emergence of new technologies and of new materials always creates questions and challenges when we're dealing with buildings that are bigger than we've ever designed or occupied before. So all over the news following the Grenfell fire, we had speculation. But does the speculation mean that simply because a building contains the materials that the same thing would happen? And, and the answer, of course, is no. You have to look at the systems. 
You also have to look at the underlying drivers. And this is a fact of our world, a fact of our industry, certainly. Cost pressures are always a part of design. They are one of the constraints. Yet, when we are looking at new materials that answer one question, we have to be careful that it is also answering the other necessary questions that people have come to expect be answered. Since the Grenfell fire, there have been discussions about our own politics, proposed cuts to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, combined with this notion that we have a tremendous lack of affordable housing, have led to some people speculating that we're really going to have a tough time of it moving forward. So yes, some of this is politicized, but also we can come up with solutions. These solutions lie in our performance-based approaches and in our codes. The codes are, after all, more or less a record of all the things that have gone wrong in the past, but also the things that have gone right. So how do the US codes address the risk and has the fire resulted in regulatory change? To look at that, it's useful to look at our history. And actually, the history goes back much farther to the 50s in Europe with the development of what we call EFIS now. Following the development of EFIS, fast forward to 1988, tests that had originally been developed by the Society of Plastics Industries to test EFIS were introduced into the Uniform Building Code, test 26-4. Another 10 years after that, these same tests were reborn, intermediate scale tests, as NFPA 285. And beginning in 2000, we had the first requirements in the International Building Code where NFPA 285 was being required. So we've had considerable time, almost two decades now, where we've had these requirements and the same or similar test methods in place to look at these materials. It has evolved. We are dealing with many combustible materials that are part of the cadre of materials that comprise modern buildings. We need these materials. We need them to address energy efficiency, weight, other performance issues. So we fill our non-combustible building types with foam plastics. We fill them with metal composite materials, high pressure laminates, reinforced polymers. The codes, however, are not uniform because of the way this country works. Some states did not even adopt the measures that have been in place for over two decades. And Understandably, now there's great pressure for those things to change. Even in 2012, as often happens, codes are a pendulum, and that pendulum swung the other way. And in 2012, the codes changed to lessen the requirements. So what gives us this confidence? Why do we do this? And it's not in a vacuum. Part of our frame of reference has been that in the United States, there has been a strong reliance on automatic suppression systems, which are really designed to control fires. But we also recognize that these systems have limitations. For the most part, we get huge bonuses when we design buildings for having automatic sprinkler systems. And if you look at the data, it is arguable that the presence of sprinklers as they have grown in buildings has made our building landscape a safer place to be. It was said by Robert Solomon of the National Fire Protection Association that we probably have zero fatalities in high-rise buildings in the US that are protected with automatic sprinkler systems. It's zero or approaching zero. That's a pretty major finding from the preeminent organization that deals with these types of statistics. 
but the systems have to be able to control the fire. This is the CCTV building, which at the time was one month away from being completed. Another exterior cladding fire, which notably did not destroy the structure, but did consume almost 100% of the exterior cladding systems. It was allegedly started by fireworks on Chinese New Year, which it sounds like are going off in the background. So the process continues to play out in that pendulum system that we have. Even now, in 2012, 2015, we see requirements that were just introduced after the collapse of the World Trade Center. So in 2012, although the Fire Safety Committee lessened the requirements, it was put on the record that they realized that this was an error. So these efforts are being undertaken to reverse this. So what is being done in the larger sense to prevent this from occurring in the future? Educational outreach is a priority. The National Fire Protection Association is looking at both new and existing buildings. They've created tools that will help authorities and fire safety professionals evaluate these buildings. And also there is a huge out reach to understand how to utilize NFPA 285, which is our primary standard for addressing combustible exterior cladding systems. The inevitable outcome of this is that we will have an increased use of NFPA 285 testing, which is good in some ways, but also extremely challenging in others. The system is an intermediate scale testing system which, as you can imagine, is also being hotly debated. As we look at the test method, we're trying to understand, does the scale affect the outcome? More appropriately, how does the scale of the test influence the severity of the fire? There have been suggestions that the severity of the fire in, in tests like NFPA 285 are not adequate. But also there are elements that we have to think about how to deal with more efficiently. An older test known as the, the Schleider method, which has come to light again from more than 50 years ago, is one where they looked specifically at the effect of gaps in co vertical combustion on exterior or vertical panel systems. They found that the size of those gaps had a disproportionate effect on the intensity of the fires. And this is something from very, very long ago that we forget and we come back to. And so the efforts have begun and they have been going on for some time, even prior to the Grenfell incident. There's a wonderful research report put out by the National Fire Protection Association Research Foundation that actually looks at the test methods. It didn't necessarily link those test methods to the types of incidents that we're seeing, however. So that is a step we need to take. As a parallel measure, there are efforts being undertaken by the likes of FM, looking at alternative test methods. And as you can imagine, alternative test methods come up with different results for the same exact assemblies. In fact, it's been said of our furnace testing, you could take the same assembly, do the same test in two different furnaces and get two different results. Which leads to the last question. How does this affect us moving forward? As I mentioned at the beginning of my portion of this discussion, the risk is the crisis of confidence. I think that is something that is unfolding in other parts of the world right now, in part because of this Grenfell fire. We are fairly close, even though we may feel insulated, to that type of risk unfolding here. And yet, 
the pressures are tremendous. We have a mandate for high energy efficiency buildings that simultaneously meet multiple needs. We have to keep the water out, keep the moisture out, allow for water to get out if it gets in. These necessitate openings and gaps that are all at odds with what we know about vertical fl flame spread on combustible cladding systems. In an article that I was reviewing on the NFPA 285 test, it really highlighted some of the challenges that we as an industry will face and are facing. And I personally have experienced these. It is this, that even as we introduce more work, more testing, our buildings are complicated and little details can make a very big difference. So naturally, this leads to requirements for more engineering judgments. And truth be told, not everyone is always comfortable with that. But yet, the complexity of our buildings is such that relying solely upon testing is not necessarily feasible. Furthermore, the implementation of specifications, going back to this notion of the golden thread. How do we write them? How do we ensure that they are implemented and who is taking responsibility. And this points to this notion that here too, we have to be taking a more systems-based approach. My final point, notice where the firefighters are spraying water in this video. That is the problem. Simply put, we cannot continue to, to design and build structures where large fires can occur unchecked out of the reach of both manual suppression and automatic suppression. We need a mechanism to control those fires and we need the robustness of the systems to allow that. So in summary, this tragedy has caused us to take a closer look at the potential scope of the problem. We have the same underlying drivers, and in some cases we have similar materials. The question that remains is, do we have systems that will spare us from the tragedy that we saw at the Grenfell? In part because of a combination of pre-existing regulation, and a view that the, by some at least, that the widespread adoption of sprinklers has made our buildings safer. Many people in our industry feel the problem is more contained, but clearly there are limitations to both what we do know about the performance of such cladding systems and what automatic suppression can possibly even do. This has meant that the previous relaxations of the code inevitably will swing back. And it opens up the door to much needed research and a critical examination of how we deal with these materials because the answer likely is not to eliminate these materials in the face of pushes for such things as timber buildings or energy efficient buildings. But the answer is, like we have always done, figure out how to address the material-specific risks. And that is what we must do. And that is all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, before we close, um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about um, what we think is a very exciting development about uh, the potential introduction of the cross system to the United States. Uh, this has been in the works for about 18 months now. Um, Alistair spent quite a bit of time re reflecting on uh, how cross works, its background, and so forth. Um, I can tell you I've made quite a bit of study. I've been a long fan of the system. Uh, here in the United States, and um, there's a lot of direct evidence about its effectiveness in the UK. 
Um, and we're excited about bringing it to the United States. We have long been interested um, through our professional societies in learning from failures and precursors, um, and we've made some progress. But I think what has been particularly effective about the cross system are two things. One is the confidential nature of the reporting in, which enables uh, or, and encourages more people to submit reports on incidences and so forth. And also the uniformity and the quality of the system of having an expert panel review. And um, in the UK, the system has a, a great deal of traction, a great deal of respect. And that's part of what um, makes it very effective. So we've been working uh, to bring CROSS to the United States. Um, Alistair has you know, uh, talked very eloquently on how it works. Um, it's been quite effective in, since 2005. Um, Alistair has been the primary driver of that. Um, but in essence, you know, we're looking to bring this system of uh, confidential reporting system to capture lessons learned um, and do a better job of minimizing the recurrence of incidences like Grenfell and other safety uh, concerns in the structural industry particularly. Um, any one of you can go on the Cross UK website currently, structuralsafety.org, uh, and without fee, uh, go in and do searches on the individual reports and the very excellent Cross newsletters, and that's what we want to bring uh, to the United States. As Alistair mentioned, uh, the model for Cross actually originated with our aviation safety reporting system uh, developed by NASA. Uh, the model has gone to the UK and now it's coming back to the United States. Um, but very simply, the way the process works is that one can report into this web-based portal uh, a report on a structural failure or incident, uh, precursors, as Alistair has said. That report is first processed. Um, and the first instance of that report can only be seen by one or two designated people who work within the cross system because that is key to part of the anonymity. Uh, that report is first anonymized by one or two people. Uh, the parties are uh, de-identified. The things that will help you might help one understand what the project is are taken out. The unnecessary information is taken out. Um, and then those reports are distributed to this um, distinguished expert panel for review um, and particularly lessons learned who aggregate their comments and then reports are published. Um, and that work is available to all uh, to influence positive change in the organization. The confidentiality aspect of this system, as I mentioned, is, is very important in encouraging people. Uh, we're using a no-blame uh, culture in this this is really not to skewer anyone, but to lesson, learn lessons from our own experiences. Alistair had a vision uh, several years ago to take the cross system international. He actually showed you, uh, shared several instances where lessons not only for fire, but in others um, uh, can be shared and are repeated um, across the globe. And so the grand vision here is to increase the use of CROSS in each of our countries and network and share that information. Uh, so um, the UK has been in operation since 2005. Uh, there's been a CROSS South Africa entity working for some time. Uh, but last year, CROSS Australia went live. And this year, we're looking to make, uh, bring CROSS live to the United States. And Germany is working in parallel so that we expect by the end of the year, the Cross International Network will um, look as shown here. And the, uh, then again, the, obviously the goal is that we share information worldwide and help each other. That's part of the theme of this conference is a, a global participation in learning uh, from problems, other instances. So how this would work in the United States, the way it's developing is the Cross US entity would be part of the Structural Engineering Institute. Um, it will be managed by an executive committee of Cross US, <clears throat> excuse me, that reports to the SEI Board of Governors. And that Cross US expert panel that I mentioned um, will report to the Board of Governors. 
We have already established an e the initial population of our executive committee. And I want to acknowledge here um, the, the very tireless work of Andy Herman in this. He's been one of the key drivers in helping us get where we are today. Most of you know Andy, very distinguished <clears throat> former president of ASCE and of the SEI. Um, Andy and I will be working on driving the XCOM. And we have so far have signed up um, some really excellent people in industry for our expert panel. Uh, ten so far. We're going to be looking to expand that. Uh, but the expert panel is multidisciplinary. We look across the spectrum of civil and structural engineering, but also bring in other um, professions like legal, uh, owners, government regulatory people, and so forth. So um, we're still recruiting, but this is our expert panel so far. So where we are today and where we are going is this. Uh, we have created a cross-US website. It's very near, ready to go live. Uh, we got seed funding from SEI to do that. Uh, the programming started a couple of months ago. We're doing final testing on that now. Um, and the URL for that website, when you're able to access it, will be cross-us.org. We have established our executive committee and expert panel. We've put together our operating plans and operating procedures, uh, drawn a lot from the experience in the UK. A great deal of care has gone into ensuring, to the extent that we can, the confidentiality but very importantly, the quality of the product that is put out there. This is really key uh, for it going forward. So um, this coming Saturday at, at the Board of Governors meeting, our Board of Governors will take up the final approval to launch. Um, um, and if that is given, uh, we will be launching probably uh, sometime being coming operational during the month of May, so very soon. This is what our cross US website looks like. It's very similar to uh, the UK website, Australia website, and so forth. Um, we had to do some translation from English to American and so forth. That was quite a challenge. Um, Andy was our hero in that exercise, but it's working um, and it, it's really excellent. So we're quite excited about that. What we need from you and from everybody um, as Alistair mentioned, is not only the major structural failures, but more available and uh, just as valid are the lesser failures, the near misses, those things are the precursors that we can learn from and we really need to uh, distribute this. So um, I ask you, anticipating a favorable approval from our Board of Governors on Saturday to keep your eye out for an announcement that Cross US is live. Again, the website is uh, www.cross-us.org. And if you're interested um, in joining our cause here in any manner, um, you can talk to me uh, or reach out to me. We've established a cross email system. My cross email is glenn at cross-us.com or you can contact Andy Herman at andy at cross-us.com. So thank you very much um, for your attention today. Um, and let's give our final, the really outstanding set of presentations from our, our pre-keynote presenters. Thank you. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference, please.